right, ladies and gentlemen, thanks again for being here for another edition of Catching Up With here at Football Fridays at the Eck. Our next guest is the all-time sacks leader here at Notre Dame. He's a pro bowler and was a super two-time Super Bowl champion with the New York Football Giants, and he's an advocate for children's literacy. Please welcome Justin Tuck. Justin, we want to talk about your time at Notre Dame and your, uh, your great career with the Giants, but, uh, but we always like to kind of hear about the beginnings first. So uh, what was your childhood like growing up in Alabama? Uh, I always tell this joke when everybody asks me where I'm from, and I always tell them that, you know, wherever I'm at, um, there's more people out here right now than it is in my hometown, Alabama, which is actually true. Um, so I grew up in Kellison, Alabama. Last census had our numbers at like 211 people. Um, but yeah, it was great. I grew up in a small town and, and all of my family was there, so I knew I had a lot of support. Um, also couldn't do anything because everybody would go back and tell my dad, so, and that, that didn't work out well for me <laughs> those times. You were a, a tremendous athlete, not just a football player, but one of the best basketball players in the, in the state of Alabama, won a couple state championships. Uh, in high school, were you a better basketball player or a football player? Yeah, I probably was a better basketball player. Um, you know, I, I grew up, we got, we got really blessed during my time there. I grew up with, with two other guys that played in the NBA, and we was all on this same little small town team. So you can, t you can understand that we didn't lose a lot of games. Um, so, yeah, I probably, my first passion was definitely basketball. If you know anything about my sisters, that had to change real quickly because I had to protect myself. So that's why I started playing football. My sisters actually got me into, into playing football. What was the recruiting process like for you, and how did you end up choosing Notre Dame? <laughs> this is a funny story if you don't know it. Um, so my sophomore year, uh, there was a linebacker in the state of Alabama that everybody was recruiting because he was probably like top five player in the country. And uh, he went to a school called Central Tuscaloosa. Now in the state of Alabama, there's three schools that has the central name to it. Central Tuscaloosa, Central Phoenix City, and Central Coosa County. At the time, that's changed now, but I, at that time, it was three schools named Central. Um, so Notre Dame staff was going to recruit this kid that, that played at Central Tuscaloosa, made the wrong turn, <laughs> and ended up driving an hour out of the way and stopping at a gas station and, and, and asking the clerk, they're looking for Central High School, didn't say Central Tuscaloosa, just playing Central High School, and they're trying to recruit this linebacker. And uh, the, I guess, luckily for me, that, that, that gas station was owned by one of my classmates' father, and she was actually the clerk there that night. And she was like, well, Central, that's the school right here, and they must be talking about Justin. So they sent the Notre Dame staff to my high school. Wrong high school. <laughs> wrong player. <laughs> I had 24 tackles, three touchdowns that night, and, and the rest is history. Well, not just lucky for you, lucky for all of us. Uh, yeah, definitely. You, uh, you came into Notre Dame as a linebacker, uh, you know, redshirted your, your freshman year, and then were, were moved to defensive end. How, how important for the future of your career was it that that, that position change happened? Yeah, you know, Greg, Coach Greg Madison was a decent coordinator at, at the time and a D-line coach, and he, he had been, like, kind of pulling at me to come play, uh, you know, defensive end. And I was like, I'm a linebacker coach. I'm not moving. <laughs> And I didn't for a while. And one day he came and whispered in my ear, and I forget um, the player that, that had just signed in the NFL, but he, he, he told me the contract numbers. And he kind of got me excited. And he was like, you need to come put your hand in the dirt. So I, I started giving it a shot and like working on it on the off season, and you know, ended up moving, and I loved it. I mean, I never had played with my hand in the dirt, and, and, I, and, and, and coach kind of saw something in me. And, that he thought would be good, and, he, and it worked out. So I owe him a lot of that, too. Yeah, I imagine you've, you've run into Coach Madison a lot. He's a lot. been in the NFL. Uh, do, you, do you thank him regularly when you see him for convincing you to make the change? You know, if you know Coach Madison, I, I, don't, I don't have to thank him because he, he throws it in my face every time. <laughs> you would not be the guy you are today if it wasn't for me. So uh, I, don't, I don't even get the opportunity to thank him. But obviously, you know, he, he was a big part of my success, not only at Notre Dame, but as I, as I grew as a player going forth to the NFL as well. You, you kind of broke out uh, on the scene for Notre Dame fans in the 2002 season as a, 
uh, kind of pass rush specialist on that team. And that, that was an exciting year for Notre Dame fans, uh, mainly because of such a great defense. What was it that made that defense so effective, not just in keeping down points, but creating turnovers and, and scoring points, the defense itself? Yeah, I think we had a really good combination of speed and, and athleticism, but also guys that really, really were smart. You know, I remember that team, you know, Shane Walton, uh, Vontez Dove, Glenn Earl, all those guys, Jerome Sapp in the secondary, that secondary was like, they were ball hawks. Like anything that was in the air, they were either knocking it down, intercepting, or, or if they got the chance to strip the ball out, it was it, it was coming out. And plus we had, a, you know, a front seven that was very tough, front four that could rush the passer. We were built for speed that year. We were built for, you know, getting after quarterbacks and putting a lot of pressure on offenses. And it, it just kind of worked out pretty well. I think we had like three touchdowns as a defense in the first three games, which is, you know, that wasn't the norm. Uh, your junior year then, you really exploded. You set the Notre Dame sacks record in a single season, which still stands uh, with 13 and a half. But at the end of that season, you tore your ACL. Uh, how hard was it for you coming off, you know, such a huge year to then have your future, you know, kind of thrown into some uncertainty with such a serious injury? You know, it's tough. I think at the time, I, I that probably was the first, I mean, adversity I went through a while here. Uh, you know, everything from up, in the, up to that point had been really smooth for me. So, you know, at off season, I really, I, I struggled mentally to kind of um, put all that behind me and didn't have as as good of a training session, I guess, as I, as I, as I wanted to. But, you know, everybody here was so supportive of me. I mean, I, I can still remember to this day the, the time I, it happened, like just, you know, all the visits I got from coaches, whether that's because it happened at the end of the season, so I was going back to the, to Alabama to be with my family. Like the coaches would come down or call or write letters, and they were all really, really, you know, staying very, very in touch with how my process was going. So, you know, it, it was it was hard, but definitely had the support to get through it. And you know, I can I can tell you how the weather is going to be this weekend with this thing here. But uh, other than that, man, it's it's, it's pretty good. Uh, the most important thing you did uh, while you were a student here at Notre Dame was that you met your wife, Lauren. And I know there's there's a funny story that uh, comes along with that. How, how did you two uh, first first meet? Oh, man. Well, the campus is completely different than what it is, I mean, what it was then. But at the time I was here, um, the stadium, and we had a road called Juniper Road that went through right by the Barlow, the Barlow Hall. And um, there used to be people that drove through Juniper Road, and it's no longer there. But So I'm coming out of um, a, a training session at um, the, the football house and crossing Juniper Road, and this car stops me and goes, uh, you know, sir, can you give me directions? And I was like, sure, where do you need to go? And he's like, I need to go to Joyce. And like, you know, how do you mess Joyce up? I'm at the football, I'm at the football stadium. Joyce is literally... <laughs> right behind it. So it's like, you can't give those the wrong directions. So I tell this guy, okay, go to stop my nigga right, Joyce, right there. He goes to stop, so I make the, makes the left. Being the nice guy that I am, I'm running after the car trying to stop this guy and telling him, no, you went the wrong way. But we had our football banquet that night, so I'm like, all right, well, he'll figure it out. So I go back, I get dressed for the banquet. And if you know anything about the football banquet, they used to pair existing players with former players and their families. So I go to the banquet, I sit down at my table, and I'm looking at this guy, and he's looking at me, and it's kind of like we've seen each other before. I'm looking at him, he's looking at me, and the first words out of his mouth, he goes, you gave me the wrong directions. <laughs> and I'm like, mm. and now I'm like, oh, that's, no, I, I'm like, no, I didn't, I told you to go right, you went left. So, long story short, this beautiful lady walks in, who's an early admitting student at Notre Dame. She's 18 years old. Her name is Lauren Williamson, who ends up is my wife now. But the guy that I gave wrong directions to, or the guy that tells the story that I gave wrong directions to, was her father. <laughs> so that was my first um, encounter with, with Fred Williamson and Lauren Williamson, who's now my father-in-law and my wife. So that's, that's the story. You, uh... He ended up having obviously a great senior year too, recovering quickly from the from the knee injury, leaving Notre Dame with the the most sacks in Notre Dame history, uh, and then you were selected in the third round of the NFL draft by by the great New York Giants. Uh, did you feel like you were underappreciated in the draft process? 
I, to, to this day, I, it's 11 defensive ends drafted before me. I played longer than any of them. Um, so to say that I kept that as a chip on my shoulder, I mean, yeah, a little bit. Um, but I understood it. I mean, at that time, you know, I, my knee hadn't, because I had a couple of uh, situations with tendonitis and things like that, so my knee hadn't fully gotten back to where it is, where it should have gotten back to. And plus, at that time, you know, you, top ten picks were making a lot of money, so they had to invest a lot of money into me. So, it, you know, the doctors red flagged me, and I ended up going third round. But I think, you know, for the, the longevity of my career, it's probably one of the better things that happened to me. I got the opportunity to obviously uh, get drafted by the best football franchise there is in the New York Giants. Won, won two Super Bowls there, but more than that, I got to play with guys like Michael Strahan and Osi Yunyuru, who, when I got there, really taught me how to play the game. Um, I didn't have to get thrown into the mix right right out of college. I got time to kind of really get healthy, one, but also learn from some of the best people that, that had ever played the game. So, you know, in a lot of in a lot of ways, I'm actually pretty thankful for you know how that draft went went about. You obviously had a spectacular career with the Giants and. And one of the highlights was it was the first of, of two Super Bowl victories over the Patriots. Heading into that first game, you know, the Giants were such huge underdogs. The Patriots were undefeated, had one of the most productive offenses ever. What was it that allowed that Giants team and, and your Giants defense to defy the odds and kind of believe that you, you could shut down that Patriots offense? Uh, I, I mean, I, I'm trying not to be, you know, like the – I'm trying to be humble about it, but our D line, we had, we just had monsters on our D line. Um, and I think I think when you're playing against a guy like Tom Brady, you have to be able to get out, get after him without blitzing, and we were able to do that. I mean, we had, like I said earlier, Michael, OC, myself, a guy named Kiwanuka, a guy named Dave Talk. Like we had horses up front, and we was able to really harass him all game. But going into the game, man, we just we had heard all week about how we didn't have a shot. So there was no pressure on us. We, I mean, we were out on the football field laughing the whole game. It was like we were playing in our backyard, and and arguably it was the most important game we ever had played in our lives. But we didn't approach it that like like that. We didn't have any pressure. They had all the pressure, so it allowed us to play loose. It allowed us to go out there and have fun. And when you're 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 hitting the quarterback as much as we was hitting that night, it was, it was fun. Uh, yeah, you mentioned that the D line in general had a great game. I think it's it's a pretty clear if you go back and watch or look at the stats that you in particular had the best game, two sacks, a forced fumble, and you were kind of in the backfield all day. When you uh, run into Tom Brady nowadays, do you ever remind him of of, uh, of that evening? Uh, no, I don't. I, I, um, <laughs> again, it's like the Coach Madison story. He kind of reminds me. He always kind of gives me that look. Well, he has five Super Bowl runs now, so yeah, I think he's over it. But, um, yeah, I think – the biggest thing that came out of that game for me and, and Tom was a kind of a mutual respect. So every time I played him after that, he, you know, he, it ain't like we go shake hands or anything, but we always gave each other that kind of look, like, because he knew I was gonna try to rip his head off, and I knew he was gonna, you know, try to throw 18 touchdowns against us. So, you know, it was, it was. I thought after that Super Bowl, we had, a, a, you know, kind of a mutual respect for each other because he's a competitor. I give him a lot of credit. I think we hit him 27 times that night, and he kept getting up and. And taking it, so you, you definitely like you like to play against people like him. Uh, the Giants got the Patriots again a, a couple years later, winning winning your second Super Bowl. Um, and at that time, you you are now the defensive captain of the team. Was it was it even more special for you winning that Super Bowl when you were one of the team's you know top top leaders on the on the squad? I get that question a lot, and I think that the right answer to it is no, because both of them were pretty special, but. But for different reasons. Obviously, being an 18 year old team, my first Super Bowl, being kind of a young pup that didn't really understand what was going on, to now being, you know, in that in that captain role where everybody's looking to you and everybody's trying to figure out or taking their, you know, the pulse of the team off of you. Um, it was special from that light because I felt like I was the leader. I felt like I was the guy that you know everybody kind of followed, and I had a little bit more invested in the team. Um, so yeah, but. but you know, it's hard, to, it's hard to say which one was better than the other one just because of that. Yeah. Uh, you know, most everyone knows about your uh, all the, the great work you did on the football field, but you've also done some incredible work off of it. You, you and uh, Lauren founded Tuck's Rush for Literacy uh, while you were still playing in the NFL. What was the inspiration uh, that, that led you to, to establishing that foundation? 
Well, a lot of it, it came from like just how I grew up. Um, growing up in a small town in Alabama, you you really didn't get the educational opportunities that most people did. I, you know, coming to a school like Notre Dame, I would probably say that I was, I mean, somewhat you know behind the eight ball when it came to you know my high school didn't have AP classes. I didn't get the opportunity to travel and see the world and and get you know exposure from that. So when I had the opportunity. Um, I definitely wanted to do some things around the educational space to change that for kids, especially kids in like Title I schools. We only work with, you know, Title I schools in the areas that we work with. Um, and it's been some of the most gratifying, some of the most, you know, just just from my own perspective, going into a classroom and, and seeing these kids light up when, when me and my wife tell them that reading is, is cool. It's really cool to learn. And, and seeing how their grades have changed over time and how they're, what they've been able to get exposed to, you know, I mean, you, I, I, I took it for granted, the fact that we, we were able to kind of take families out of Alabama that we worked with and, and bring them to New York for the first time, and just how that, you know, it affected their lives. And we're, we're 10 years deep in it now, and just the stories of success that we've had throughout this program is just something that I'll always cherish, and, and I think I, I'm more proud of that than anything else that I've ever did. You retired from the NFL a few years ago. I'm sure you could have done a lot of different things, and you decided to go back to school and enroll in uh, business school at Wharton at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, what made you uh, make that choice, and, and what are you hoping to do uh, with that degree when you when you graduate uh, in less than a year here? Yeah, um, I think I went back to I didn't I don't know why I went to Wharton, um, but I know why I went back to school. I retired and. I was living the retired football life, where that is going to play golf every day, um, watching watching Sports Center uh, the rest of the day, and going to pick your kids up. And me and my family, we have a ritual at every every dinner we we have at the house. You have to say something good about your day and what you did all day. And after four days of playing golf, I couldn't sit there and tell my kids that I played golf today, uh, because what stops them from being the kid when they're 21, 22 years old and saying, "Well, my dad sat on the couch all day. Why can't I?" So, because um, they, they, they weren't going to remember that I sacked Tom Brady four times in the Super Bowl or anything <laughs> like that. Um, so, I knew then that I, I needed to get up and do something. And I knew, I knew I, but I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I felt as though going back to school would kind of give me, um, one, the knowledge, the experience, and the exposure around whatever that next step was going to be. Um, I had a really good friend um, who uh, said that I should look at Warden. And I was like, why? Um, but, you know, obviously, um, I wanted to do something quantitative, and Warden is probably the best school uh, from that perspective. So I did all the due diligence around applying, applied, had 11 days to take the GMAT, somehow passed it, and, uh, and I'm now a year away from getting my MBA from Warden. Well, congrats on that. Um, I'm sure you still follow. Thank you. I'm sure you still follow the, the Notre Dame football team pretty closely and watched the win over Temple last week. Uh, what, what did you think of the, the defensive performance, and how are you feeling heading into tomorrow night's game with Georgia? You know, I'm excited for this Georgia game. I am. I, I think it's a good test. And last week I thought they came out and they handled their business. They did what they needed to do. And, you know, the players know me. They know I'm going to say, well, it wasn't good enough. Because, you know, I'll never say, oh, that's awesome. Great job. No, that's not how I was raised. I was raised from, like, you know, we got <laughs> my my defensive coordinator was mad at us, and we 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 uh we kept Tom Brady from scoring touchdowns, and it's like, nah, you can do better. So I'm gonna tell them today, you can do better, and I want them to come out there and shut a team out. I think they have the talent to be dominant, and you know, I don't I don't I don't want anybody on that team to think that you guys don't expect that to be the case. So that's exactly what I, I want to see from them tomorrow night. I want to see a dominant defense. I want to see an offense that's gonna run. And I, I'm not cheating on the left, right side. I love the right side of our O-line. But Brian Kelly, run the ball to the left side of the O-line until Georgia stops it. That's that's how I was raised. That's how I, I, I know George Bell would agree with me when I'm saying that. Run it until they stop it. Because that's how I, I like old school football. And I think we have the type of team that can do that, where they can really impose their will on teams and really get them in the full court and where teams just can't hang with them no more. So I'm, I'm excited for the season. I'm excited for this game, man. And I'm, I'm just really, really happy to be back here to support. All right. Well, we're happy to have you back. We're going to take a few quick questions from the audience. Raise your hand if you got a question for Justin. We've got some Alumni Association staff members coming around with a microphone. 
Got a question right here, I think. Justin, thanks for playing for my two favorite teams and contributing so well. Uh, can we sneak you in tomorrow night? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, uh, I still have a year of eligibility left, man, so uh, <laughs> uh, I might... I don't know. I don't know if I can get a helmet with a visor on it, whether the referees don't know who it is. But you know, I, I could I could give you a few plays on third and long. <laughs> got another question over here. Hey Justin. Oh I, God. Why did I give him a mic? <laughs> hey, I got a question for you. So, you we play for the Giants. You play for the for uh, Notre Dame. Can you explain the difference or this compare what it was like? To play for both, does it both feel like a family, or tell us what the family is like with the Giants? I, I knew George was gonna say. <laughs> um, so I played for the Raiders too. For George, uh, shout out to the Raiders as well. Um, I think the the fact that I got the opportunity to play for those two teams, and obviously the Raiders as well, but mainly Giants and the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. It, I don't think it, 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 when you talk about family, man, it, I don't I don't think you can put any other teams in that category. Maybe they like the Steelers with the Rooney family and so on and so forth. But like when I think about family and just the history of these 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 teams, you know, I've been really really blessed to be a part of those type of units where it's like you know the saying here at Notre Dame is you don't come to Notre Dame for four years, you come here for forty, and forty is just a you know a number a, you know that means forever. The same thing with the Giants, it, and we have a slogan, once a Giant, always a Giant. It, it, it's such a similar, similar, you know, type of feel in both organizations that, you know, it, it, again, I, I know I'm tremendously blessed to be a part of those two and, and, and have had success there. And, and from the perspective of, like, now I'm not at Notre Dame anymore, but I'm still family. I'm not, you know, with the Giants anymore. I'm still family. I still get... I mean, my emails are probably the most, the most emails I get are probably from people from Notre Dame and people from the Giants organization. And that's, that just kind of sums up what, what I think of the, of the two and just how, how special the two are. More questions for Justin? Got one over here. What were your favorite non-football memories of your time here at Notre Dame? Um, non football memories, I would probably say winning bookstore as a freshman. <laughs> yeah, I was MVP. You know, you know. <laughs> no, seriously though, I think <laughs> the most fun I had on, on campus when the opportunity came about where we could interact with um, the student body. You know, like once the once football season was over and we had that like week where we didn't have anything to do. That's a given. George Bell's are like meeting my wife. I've already <laughs> talked about my wife. Um, but like getting the opportunity to kind of really interact with the student body. You know, places like this are, are made up of really special people from all different backgrounds and just li learning more about their story. I mean, everybody wants to talk about Justin Tuck, but I'm the type of guy that I want to learn about the kid down the hall that, you know, that's from West Lafayette, Indiana, wherever that may be. You know, these kids, all, everybody has a unique story here and getting the opportunity to just go around and like, you know, learn from their experiences. I think that's what kind of makes this university special, man. Nobody, you know, nobody's really the same, man. And I think so. people are so welcoming to, you know, I'm a kid from Kellerton, Alabama, and everybody wanted to know, they didn't want to know about me sacking quarterbacks on Saturday. They wanted to know, what's Kellerton like? And I think, you know, that, that again, goes back to that family component where, you know, everybody's invested in everybody. So that's probably my second favorite moment in Notre Dame. And as George Bell said, man, meet my wife here who is way smarter and, and in football there's a, there's a saying, it's called outkicking your coverage. If you know my wife, I definitely outkick my coverage. So, um, yeah, those, those three are pretty special in my book. Next question. Uh, so, so one thing that I, I think a lot of uh, New York sports fans appreciated when you were on the Giants is that I'd say more than any New York athlete, you really embrace the other teams in New York, like the Knicks and the Rangers. What, what led, led to that? Was it just sort of a natural thing? It seems like you were a, sort of a huge fan of those teams. Well, I grew up a Yankee fan. My favorite player of all time is a guy named Thurman Munson. I didn't even get to see him play before he died, but that's my favorite 
baseball player ever. My dad used to take Yankee games, and I rewatched them and fell in love with Thurman Munson. So I'm, I'm a Yankee fan through and through. That happened before, yeah. Yeah, before I can even remember. The Knicks is interesting because um, the Knicks and the Rangers happened pretty similarly because um, both organizations asked me to just come out and, and you know watch a game and I so I got the opportunity to watch a Rangers game playoff game as a uh, and, and, and watch the Rangers play in the playoff game and if you ever been to playoff hockey it's like football on ice with a stick <laughs> and they let you fight and I'm like. Why couldn't Alabama have ice? <laughs> um, <laughs> so that's how I fell in love with with, the, was, with hockey and just Knicks being in Madison Square Garden and you know the first night I'm there I get to shake hands with Charles Oakley and and, and, and Starks and all those guys and you know it, it's you know you grow up in Alabama I was I didn't grow up a Knicks fan but you grew up like seeing all those those classic games in Madison Square Garden. And that's kind of how I, you know, I, I started because Alabama we don't have any sports teams so it wasn't like I was ingrained in like you know, any, any Alabama pro team. So once I got to New York, I, I thought it was really smart of me to ingrain myself in those, you know, the town. So that's pretty much how it happened. All right, we got time for uh, one more question from Dolly Duffy from the Alumni Association. Here. Oh, God. All right, so um, I'm Dolly Duffy. I'm the executive director of the Alumni Association. Um, I want to thank all of you for coming. And I want to give a shout out. Greg, great job. Classmate of mine, class of 84. Thanks for being here. And I want to tell a quick story about Justin, because we hear about football and we hear about all the things he does. But my favorite story is a personal one. We were down at the national championship game, and one of my young sons was, was sitting with Justin Tuck and had no idea who he was. And he's just kind of sitting there. There were a few people watching. And apparently he said, so, so did you ever play football at Notre Dame? <laughs> Justin Tuck apparently said, yeah, I, I did play a little football. <laughs> So the conversation keeps going, and a little while later he said, so, so what have you been doing since then? <laughs> right? And Justin said, well, I've, I've been playing professional football. How, how'd it go? Well, he takes his phone out, and he shows him a couple Super Bowl rings. And so still back and forth, and he said, so are, are you going to get to go to the game later? <laughs> the national championship game. So he assured Kieran that he was going to the game and was glad to learn that Kieran did. And I, I think that speaks volumes about uh, the way you interact, your kindness. And so we've never forgotten that. So Kieran is here, and he was so delighted he didn't have school so he could come say hello. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. <laughs> All right, Justin, last thing we need before we let you go, what's your prediction for tomorrow night? 27-21, go Irish. Yeah. All right. We'll take it. <laughs> Justin, thanks so much for being here. Give a hand for the great Justin Tuck. Thanks, guys.